Daudi, in this video, we're going to discuss the cold loss or the high energy loss spectra and the imaging in yields. Before going to the technical details, I'd like to introduce you one website, yields.info. If you're interested in using yields as one of the characterization tools for your research, I strongly recommend you to go through some of the information in this website. In fact, Many of the figures in this video are taken from this website in addition to the Williams and Carter TEM textbook. Let's start by asking a very fundamental question. What makes the core loss spectra we see in eels? Ideally, after the inelastic scattering, there will be some energy loss, and the energy loss follows the sawtooth shape. Such a feature is called an edge rather than a peak. It is also called the hydrogenic edge. In all spectroscopy, we always have a background. In eels, the ideal hydrogenic edge will be superimposed on top of the background. Furthermore, when the core shell electron is getting ejected, it cannot go to any random places. It has to occupy one available state above the Fermi level. The electron can also escape from the atom not occupying any available states. These scenarios will lead to the energy loss near edge structure as well as the extended energy loss fine structure. This information will be added to the hydrogenic edge and the background. We will discuss more on the energy loss near edge structure and the extended energy loss fine structure in the next video. Moreover, we have one more complication. Most TEM foils will be thicker than one link free path. So we have the plural scattering convoluted with the single scattered edge. In order to do EOS quantification, we need to first remove the background, then deconvolute the plural scattering. And finally, we can do quantification. I will use an example from my research. What we are looking at is the boron K edge. All the spectra here were taken from the same grain but with different thickness values. The blue one is acquired from the thinnest region, the red one is taken from a thin region, and the green curve is taken from a thick region. They look similar, but not the same. Let's focus the background for now. You can clearly see that as the sample gets thicker and thicker, the background becomes more and more prominent. The most common way to model and remove background is to use the power law. In the left figure, there are a few things I'd like to draw your attention to. The gamma models the background fit window. You can extend it to the signal you want to integrate. IB here is the modeled background. Only IK here is the signal you want to use for quantification. Delta here is the signal integration window. The figure on the right is a real-life example. The solid green area is the raw data. The red curve is the background. And the area enclosed by the solid green line is the signal after background removal. There is a quick note here. If you have multiple edges present in the spectra, you need to model the background separately. The example here is boron nitride. It is intuitive to do the background removal for boron but for nitrogen, you have to do a separate background removal. After background removal, we need to look into the plural scattering deconvolution. Coming back to our original example, where we have the same grain but different thickness values. If you look at the region shaded in blue, the thinnest sample has a very small hump. As the sample gets thicker and thicker, the hump becomes more and more prominent. What you're looking here is from the plural scattering in eels, the edges we observe ideally are ionization edges from single scattering events. However, most of the TEM foils we have are thicker than one mean free path. The ionization edge caused by the single scattering is convoluted by the low loss scattering events, which gives you additional intensity in your eels spectra. There are a number of algorithms to perform deconvolution I will not go through the detailed maths here. The example on the left is after background removal. The dark line shows the signal before the deconvolution. 
and the light blue one shows after the deconvolution, where the plural scattering contribution is removed. After the background removal and the plural scattering deconvolution, we are ready for EOS quantification. On the left is the quantification equation. N is the number of atoms in the probed volume. N is equal to IK over I0 multiplied by sigma K. IK is the integral at K intensity without the background, without the plural scattering. K here indicates the K edge. I0 is the zero loss peak intensity. Sigma K is the partial inelastic scattering cross section. It describes the possibility of having the inelastic scattering for this specific K edge. Notice for I K and the sigma K, there are brackets beta and delta. What this tells you is the intensity and the partial inelastic cross section at the collection angle beta using an energy window delta. Again, here you can see the importance of beta in eels. If you are looking at the compositional ratio of two elements, for example, say A and B in your material, you can easily use Na over Nb to obtain it. On the right hand side of this equation is simply Ia multiplied by sigma B over Ib multiplied by sigma A. Since both EDS and EOS can be used for elemental identification and quantification, using this slide I like to compare these two techniques. In EDS, we have the incident electron beam hitting the specimen, and X-ray will be generated. X-ray will be emitted in all directions. However, only a small fraction of X-ray can be captured by the EDS detector. In EOS, we're looking at the energy loss in electrons after the inelastic scattering. Again, we have the electron beam hitting the specimen. The signal we collect are the forward scattered electrons. In this case, most of the signals are acquired. From this, we can tell EOS will have much better signal-to-noise ratio compared to EDS. Let's look at an example of stem EOS and stem EDS. Both are atomic level chemical maps. It is pretty clear that the stem EOS has better signal-to-noise ratio and a better spatial resolution compared to stem EDS. Let's use one slide to summarize what we have learned in terms of low loss and core loss spectroscopy. In the EOS spectrum, we have the zero loss peak, we have the plasmon peak, and we have the characteristic edges. The zero loss peak is above the Fermi energy. The plasmon peak is at the energy level of the conduction band or the valence band. The core losses are from the electrons deep in the potential wells. Deeper in the potential wells they are, higher the energy they will appear in eels. There's one parallel technique called energy field to TEM, which I did not cover in this video. This is mainly because nowadays more and more people are doing stem eels instead of doing the energy filtered TEM. I will place the link in the comment section of this video if you are interested in checking this technique out. In the next video, we'll discuss what we can learn from the fine structures and fine details from the core loss edges.